this is the Geauga Park District uh, presenting, which is, and their mission is to preserve, conserve, and protect the natural features of Geauga County, Ohio, and to provide outdoor recreational experiences to residents of every age, every ability, and at all times of the year. They currently have over 70 miles of trails across their 27 parks. So definitely something to get out and check out if you haven't. And then our presenter tonight is Carrie Wheaton. She's been with the Geauga Park District for seven years, and she is the Summer Camp and Maple Sugar Program Coordinator. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to kind of turn it over to Carrie, and awesome. we'll get going. Yay, thank you, Amber. I'm so excited to see a group here to learn all about maple sugaring tonight. So this program is not going to highlight the science or the way maple syrup is produced so much. It will touch on it a little bit, but this is a lot of the memories and kind of history of the maple heritage in Geauga County, but really Northeast Ohio. This really is the heart of maple syrup production in the state. And like Amber said, I am the maple sugaring program coordinator. So I actually am not doing the producing of maple sugaring or maple syrup out here in our parks. Um, I get to do all the programs that teach folks about maple sugaring um, history and science. So this program, like I said, is going to kind of highlight the history and some memories of maple sugaring. And hopefully it brings up some memories that maybe you have from childhood or maybe not childhood as an adult. Maybe you helped someone make maple syrup. So at the end, I'd love if we have time to hear some, maybe some maple sugaring or maple syrup memories of yours from your lifetime. So before we actually get started into our history and our memories, I would like to show you this. So the question is, is this maple syrup? Hopefully all of you are shouting at your computer, no way, that's not maple syrup. So in order to prove myself, I'm going to read you the ingredients. So if you're at home, you can raise your hand if you hear the word maple. So here are the ingredients in this. We have sugar, sugar syrup, high fructose corn syrup, water, cellulose gum, mm, natural and artificial flavor, salt, sorbic acid, sodium benzoate, caramel color, citric acid, and here's my favorite, sodium hexametaphosphate. Mm. So is this maple syrup? No, this is not what we're here talking about today. This is not maple syrup. This is syrup made from corn. So some people might prefer that, but today we are talking about pure Ohio maple syrup. And where does this come from? Maple syrup is collected from maple trees. And here in Geauga Park District, we produce our maple syrup at Swine Creek Reservation in Middlefield. And we tap about 800 trees. And every year, well, an average, I guess, is about 130 gallons of syrup that we actually produce. So that is a little bit about uh, maple syrup and our production here at, at Geauga Park District. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So I will go ahead and share my presentation. And please, again, like Amber said, if anyone has questions, go ahead and use that chat feature. Um, this presentation is a lot of pictures and then I'll narrate them as we go along. So please let me know if I'm talking too fast or too quietly as well. I've never been told I'm too quiet, but all right. So with its origins in Native American know-how, maple sugaring became deeply rooted in the history, economy, and culture of Geauga County, the maple capital of Ohio Lake County. Um, Northeast Ohio is really the heart of maple production, but I think Geauga County might be able to claim um, the maple capital of Ohio. So tapping into the early history of maple sugaring, this program flows like maple sap into a nostalgic look at 20th century maple syrup making as practiced by Geauga farm families. So let's talk a little bit about tree biology. Where did all of this sugar come from? So sugar in maple sap is the result of last year's photosynthesis that converted carbon dioxide um, and water into sugar. And sugar is then stored in the tree, in the roots, and in the rest of the tree 
during uh, winter's dormancy. So as trees come out of dormancy in spring, that starch is uh, converted back into usable sugar for the tree. So that's very important for us when we're collecting sugar from our maple trees. So why can we collect sap? That's another important thing. We can collect sap from a few species of trees, but maple trees have the sweetest sap and seem to produce the most amount of maple sap of any of our trees. So during warm periods, um, when temperatures rise above freezing, pressure develops in the tree. And so this pressure um, allows sap to flow out of a hole when there's a wound or a tap hole. So we drill a hole into the tree. Today, we drill a hole into the tree. And that pressure uh, kind of wants to equalize. And so anything inside of the tree will squeeze its way out of that wound. So during cooler periods then, when temperatures fall below freezing, suction actually develops in the tree and the tree can replenish the water throughout the entire system. So up the trunk and into the branches, which allows the sap to flow during the next freeze thaw cycle. And so why do we tap maple trees? So like I said, we can actually tap a number of different tree species. There's birch syrup, hickory syrup, um, butternut syrup, black walnut syrup. But if you've ever tasted those, none of them compare to our pure maple syrup. So it, they're all produced in the same way. You collect sap and then boil them down to get the product. But maple syrup has a higher sugar content and a better taste of any of those other tree species. So we're going to get down to the different stages of maple production. So there's actually five different stages that you can break down maple production into. And then we'll go through the history of how this has been done throughout history. So there are five different stages. You tap, you need to capture the sap that flows out of that tap hole. You need to take the sap from the tree to the location where you're going to process it or boil it. You're then going to actually boil the sap into syrup and then package and store either the sugar that you produce or the syrup that you produce. So uh, maple sugaring actually has its history with our Native Americans. So in the many millennia, millennia following their arrival in the Americas, Native peoples came to know the food, medicinal and material qualities of every kind of plant, animal and rock type in their forested environment, which includes maple trees. So in the far distant past, the people of North America worked up methods of obtaining sugar from sap. And you can see some of those pictures here. So what they would do is they would gash the tree. Sometimes they would box the tree and remove a large section of bark to get to the sap wood of the maple tree or they would take their stone ax and make large gashes in the tree. And then they would direct the sap flow from those wounds with a bark chip into some sort of collecting vessel. So it may have been birch trees farther north, but here in Northeast Ohio, it was likely elm bark that they harvested from trees and created gathering vessels. All right, so then, in order to produce the, the sugar, the sap from a maple tree, I don't think I touched on that yet, but the sap from a maple tree, if you're talking a sugar maple tree is only about 2% sugar. So if you were to taste that sap directly from the tree, it really only tastes like maybe very lightly sweetened water. I don't even really taste the sugar. So that's a sugar maple tree. That's about 2% sap or sugar in a sap. In red maple trees, which we also tap, they're about half that, 1% sugar. So in order to process that sap into something that's a lot sweeter, it has to be boiled. And they didn't have, at this time, big, large cauldrons like we have, or um, evaporators like we have today, or even iron kettles to boil their sap in. So what they would do is they would hollow out logs and place the sap into those hollowed out logs. And you can see in this picture, it looks like the woman has a rock um, being held by two sticks. So they would place rocks in a fire, heat the rocks up and then drop them into the sap. And we actually demonstrate this here at Geauga Park District. And when you drop the rock into the sap, you can see the steam rise. So if this is done enough times, you can actually um, concentrate the sugar in the sap and get the sap hot enough that it might even boil. 
So the sap probably wasn't anything, I'm sorry, the syrup that they produced or the sweet substance probably wasn't anything like we have today because there was probably a lot of ash from the fire mixed in with that sweet, sweet sap. So then we kind of move into a more recent stage in history. So we can call this maybe early American sugaring in the early to mid 1800s. So European settlers learned from the Native Americans about this process, but they um, also started using their technology. So instead of gashing trees with a stone ax, um, they used different tools. And you can see they, they weren't using those bark collecting vessels anymore either. So um, New England settlers arrived in the Western Reserve and they were already ready made sugar makers. So while Ohio was deforested for farming, uh, Geauga County settlers actually set aside groves of sugar maple trees that they used as sugar bushes. So if you've heard the word sugar bush before, it's just a forest filled with a lot of maple trees. So along with their tapping tools, um, they also used big cast iron all-purpose all kettles. So they were also used for these kettles that you can see hanging over the fire weren't only used for producing uh, maple sugar or maple syrup. They were also used for potash, soap, apple butter, um, and scalding hogs. So they were kind of multi-purpose kettles. And sugaring time was a, a time of celebration for these early settlers. Um, so after being cooped up all winter, which maybe some of us are feeling that this winter, cabin fever ran rampant, rampant among the settlers. Um, the maple sugaring season was celebrated as the end of winter's dreariness and isolation. And so sugar bush camps were then set up in the sugar bush and um, sap gatherers and kettle tenders were actually camped out in the sugar bush during this season. So here are the tools that they used for producing maple sap or getting maple sap from the tree. So a little different than the bark chips and stone axes. This was considered a little less of a crude method. They used something called an auger to create a hole in the tree. And then they created spiles or the spouts that actually direct the sap from the tree into a collecting vessel. They're called spiles. And they created these out of either sumac or elderberry branches. They have a really soft pith or center to them. And so they could easily kind of get that pith out and it created almost like a tube. And the tube was inserted into the hole that was produced by the auger. You can see that auger laying against the tree. And the sap was collected in a collecting vessel, which was a hollowed out log. And these were set on the ground because those spiles weren't strong enough to hang or support anything. I'm hanging from them. So this was kind of the early method of for collecting sap from the tree. So here are some photos of them actually gathering sap from the trees. So gathering sap in cold, wet weather was hard work. So we always joke that all of our maple sugaring programs, you know, it's maple sugaring season when it's 35 degrees and raining. So it's never beautiful, warm weather when you want to be out collecting sap. Um, but March is kind of a harsh season, so it was hard work. Uh, troughs and buckets were emptied into gathering pails. So you can see the gentleman there has a shoulder yoke with two pails hanging from it. They would pour the sap from those troughs into the gathering pails and then empty those gathering pails into a larger uh, barrel that may have been on a sled pulled by people or even pulled by a team of oxen through the sugar bush. So they would then take that sap they collected to a boiling location. So here's an example of what a cauldron may have looked like where they boiled and produced or boiled down the sap into syrup. So this is a cast iron cauldron. So as water boiled away, the shrinking volume of liquid was vulnerable to scorching. To avoid burning, fresh sap was added. So the sap cooked for a really long time in these cauldrons, in these kettles. And so it normally had a really dark kind of burnt flavor and strong tasting, I guess is another good way to say it. So as frontier settlements grew into towns, uh, trade shops started to open and better hardware for sugaring became available. So blacksmiths forged augers, like I talked about earlier, they made about an inch hole in the tree instead of those gouge methods that the Native Americans used. 
and they allowed the trees to heal faster um, in future years. So when you actually produce or when you put a hole into a maple tree for tapping, you are damaging the wood. The tree tries to compartmentalize that wound that you've put in the tree. So a little bit of wood on either side of the tool and uh, about a foot above and a foot below about um, that tree will be damaged and won't be able to be tapped into in future years. So if you can imagine a huge gash or a box taken out of the bark of a tree would create a lot of damaged wood. So just an inch hole created a lot less damaged wood and would help preserve these maple trees for future maple sugaring seasons. Local Cooper started making buckets out of oak and these buckets were a little bit better than those wooden troughs, but they would have to soak them overnight for the wood to swell so that sap wouldn't drain between the um, slats of wood that were held together with the metal. But these were kind of one of those advances in the maple sugaring. So they went from troughs to wooden buckets and also wooden gathering tanks that were pulled by horses or oxen. So as travel and trade improved, other sugar making, other sugar making equipment also became available. So they moved from that large cauldron system to a three kettle system. It kind of refined the flavor of the maple syrup that they were producing. And so they would start the sap in one kettle and when it was boiled down, they would move it to the next kettle. And when that was processed down a little further, the final kettle. This allowed the sap to not scorch like it did in that large kettle and had a little bit less of that burnt or strong flavor that they had. So actually during this time, if they weren't using the syrup immediately, they would boil the syrup all the way down into sugar because it would spoil because they didn't have airtight containers at this time. So with the metal kettles, the sap could be boiled into heavy, heavy syrup that was crystallized when stirred. And you can actually still do this today if you have a pure maple syrup, if you boil it to the correct temperature and continue to stir it, you can actually get granulated sugar that's delicious in coffee. And this solid sugar could last a year where the maple syrup that, if you just have a maple syrup jug and leave it out of the fridge, it can actually spoil or grow mold. So sugar stored a lot better than our processed maple syrup. All right, so we're going to move a little bit farther up the timeline or closer to modern day, I guess we should say. So revolutionary advancements in maple sugaring. This would be the mid 1800s to the late 1800s. So equipment kind of changed. So as a tool, a, a tool that saw continuous evolution during it, its development was the brace and bit. So hand off half the spin. And it would take a long time to build a hole or drill a hole, build a hole, drill a hole. And so this hand auger, I'm sorry, brace and bit, um, you put the drill bit into the one end and you push it against the tree and then push your body against that round end. And then you can spin the handle and it uh, produced a hole a lot faster than that hand auger did. And it also made a smaller hole at this time. So draft horses then had also largely replaced slower oxen as work animals for the farm and their duties included pulling the sap sled. So horses were actually better suited for physically pulling the new farm equipment developed in the late 1800s. And then during this time, the sheet metal industry actually revolutionized maple sugaring because uh, maple syrup could actually be stored in airtight containers at this time. And so it didn't have to be boiled down all the way into sugar for storage. So then uh, sheet metal also brought about the first flat bottom metal evaporating pans. So this is the mid 1800s when these were started to be produced a little bit more like what we're used to instead of those kettles. So with a flat pan, a much greater volume of sap has a greater heated surface contact with the fire that's being built underneath it. So sap can be boiled down in a lot shorter time period and it results in a higher quality syrup than the kettle boiled sap. And evaporators were also mounted on, on top of a brick base called an arch. So maybe you've heard that being referred to if you've ever visited a sugar house before. The arch is where the fire is produced underneath the flat bottom evaporating pan. And then the syrup was finished off 
in a separate pan. So the smoke, ash, and heat escaped through the chimney at the end of the arch and steam rises from the pan. So this time of year, if you're ever driving out in Geauga County or maybe even Lake County, if you see steam rising from a sugar house, you know maple syrup is being produced. So over a few short decades in the late 1800s, the evolution advanced rapidly and new models were larger and more complex as they gained efficiency in boiling sap to syrup. So a lot of our evaporators were actually manufactured in Northeast Ohio, which is another reason why we are the maple capital of Ohio. And that includes Geauga County. So the GH Grimm evaporators were first made in Hudson, Ohio before moving to Vermont. The IXL evaporators, the IXL evaporators were made in Middlefield and the Parks, uh, Bar Parks and Barker made evaporators in their tin shop um, were made behind Main Street on um, Chardon Square. How did they first discover that they could use, I'm sorry, I'm reading the questions here. I just saw that I had chats. I apologize that I didn't see those earlier. So April says, I have a question. How did they first discover that they could use the sap from maple trees to make maple sugar and maple syrup? So that's a great question. I think that they probably watched animals. So squirrels to this day will chew the branches of a maple tree and lap up the sweet sap in springtime. And I'm sure they saw this and thought, well, there must be something to that and then tried it themselves. And then there's also just a story that says Indian chief's wife pulled an ax that was out of a tree and saw water coming from it. Instead of going to the stream, she collected the water from that tree and made dinner in it that night. And that's how maple syrup was discovered. I think it was probably them just being observant and watching um, nature unfold. All right, thank you, April. I'll try to keep my eye on that. All right, so our flat bottom evaporator pans were made here in Northeast Ohio. So syrup was done when it sloughed off the scoop in sheets. So you can see the picture of this gentleman here. You knew you were a tried and true maple sugar maker or maple syrup maker when you picked up your scoop and it aproned off the scoop in the perfect consistency. That's how they figured uh, maple syrup was done and ready to be pulled off the evaporator. So they took it off the evaporator and put it into a wool filter into a milk can. And this filtered out any sugar sand that may have boiled out of the sap when it was being processed and any other things. If you ever look in a bucket uh, or a bag in the springtime and see the critters that are attracted to the sweet sap, you'll be thankful that we filter our maple syrup before it's bottled. So sugar sand are minerals that are kind of precipitated out through the boiling process. It's also called nitre. And if you were to ever have maple syrup that didn't have the sugar sand or those minerals filtered out, it would actually be crunchy. And we don't want that in our syrup. Some people actually do ask, though, for unfiltered syrup because they prefer all of those minerals in their syrup for health reasons. But uh, we, it's normal process to actually filter syrup before it's bottled. Um, evaporators were a big investment, and so sugar houses started to be erected around the evaporators to protect them. So this led to um, sugar shanties or sugar shacks, which we now know today as sugar houses. A tin replaced wood for sap buckets. And that was important because the buckets could then be hung from the metal spile that was placed into the tree. And a lot of these buckets had lids. So if sap is already only about one or 2% sugar, you don't want rainwater going into your bucket because it's going to make producing maple syrup that much more difficult. So the buckets could be hanged from trees with lids that protected that precious maple sap. So these are some um, different spiles that were then created. So they're no longer at this time made from elderberry or sumac. They were produced from metal. So other hardware inventions included spiles. So they could be made from rolled sheet metal or cast iron and could support the weight of an entire bucket hanging from them. And like I said earlier, along with sheet metal evaporators, it also allowed maple syrup to be stored as maple syrup and not just sugar. So long-term storage was possible, which is a big deal. <laughs> All right, so the early to mid 
20th century. So almost here to modern day maple sugaring. So most maple producers at this time were dairy farmers who made maple syrup and sugar during the off season of their farm. And they used that income for extra income by selling the syrup and sugar at market. And uh, local Amish farmers have been long practitioners of maple sugaring and also still maintain a large presence among sugar makers today. So by the early 20th century, advances in syrup production resulted in higher quality syrup with a standardized grading syrup from lightest to darkest. And these actually, these grades just changed. So a lot of folks don't know, let me grab a jug here. I could show you this when I actually share my screen, but hopefully you can see my picture in the corner. But maple syrup is actually um, produced syrup, uh, maple sugar makers, maple syrup makers cannot choose what color of syrup they make. Lighter maple syrup has a lighter maple flavor. Darker maple syrup has a darker maple or a richer maple flavor, we should say. And all of the jugs of syrup that you see should have some sort of maple grade on them. So the sticker I'm holding up to my camera here is amber maple syrup, or it has a rich taste. So the four color classes are golden delicate, amber rich, dark strong, and very dark, very dark strong, and very dark, very strong, I think are the four um, maple grades. So these colors are produced um, throughout the season. Normally the season starts off and the producers make a really light colored syrup because there's it's normally cold. There's not a lot of bacteria, naturally occurring bacteria breaking down the sugars and the sap that are in the, the lines or um, the buckets that are hanging there. And so the lighter colors made. Later in the season, the sugar content changes. Bacteria might be breaking down those naturally occurring sugars. It takes longer to boil, more caramelization happens, and a darker syrup is produced. They all taste wonderful. Some people prefer the delicate flavor. Some people prefer the very dark flavor. I'm an amber rich girl myself. <laughs> so we have international grading standards now. So the United States and Canada all abide by the same standards now. Um, the next few slides highlight some sweet memories of maple sugaring that are well remembered by folks today. So maybe some of these pictures will give you some memories uh, from uh, earlier times of maple sugaring. So you can, I'm sorry, gathering sap with a team of horses. So we actually still do this at Geauga Park District today. I know Lake Metro Parks also gathers sap with horses. Sometimes sap, sap tanks would tip over Kids used to drink maple sap right out of buckets, which we don't recommend. The bacteria can cause some digestive issues. So maybe you have some memories of that as well. <laughs> you can remove ice from the buckets. Ice that freezes in a bucket is just water. And so you can toss that out and then the sugar is actually concentrated in the bucket. But sometimes you take off the bucket lid and there's a mammal or something like a flying squirrel in the bucket that was attracted to the sap. So maybe you remember that. I love maple sugaring season because it's so apparent all of the signs of spring around us. So during sugaring season, you'll start to hear woodpeckers drumming on trees. And that is a sign of spring. They're starting to announce their territories to other males. The males are announcing their territories to other males or trying to attract females, which is exciting. Um, you may hear birds start singing right now. Uh, chickadees are singing their spring song. They say spring here or sweetheart. A tufted titmouse are, are singing their Peter, 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 Peter. Uh, I even heard cardinals singing their cheer, cheer. So I love springtime in the sugar bush because there's signs of spring all around us. Maybe you even encountered a skunk out in the sugar bush. I know I smell them a lot in the evenings this time of year. They wander around at night looking for love. And so sugar makers used to come in contact with these critters while they were out checking their buckets in the sugar bush. Um, I think that a lot of people remember getting their tractors stuck in the mud in the sugar bush. How could you forget that? Uh, tractors... <clears throat> actually cause a lot of root 
compassion on maple trees. So it's recommended a lot of people use tubing today to collect their sap. It helps keep these tire tracks and tire ruts out of the sugar bush and help protect the maple trees. But this is another memory that's hard to forget. Wagon rides out in the sugar bush. So people used to take picnics out to the sugar bush or uh, folks would even boil eggs in the evaporator while the sap was boiling for hard boiled eggs. Um, I'm sure maybe some of us at least have made a maple stir. They're delicious. You heat syrup up to a certain temperature and stir it in a bowl and it starts to crystallize into a maple cream. And then uh, making, making maple candy. I just bought some maple candy at a local producer last week and I had to be honest with them. I ate it all before I got back to the office. It's so good and addictive. So maple candy, it's again, just maple syrup heated to a certain temperature and poured into a mold and the crystals start to crystallize and form a candy. Delicious. And a lot of folks have great memories of winning prizes um, for their maple syrup or sugar. And we still today have little rivalries and feuds between sugar ma makers who can make the best syrup. And just as an interesting kind of aside to this, Northeast Ohio actually wins international awards for the maple syrup that's produced. So maple syrup almost has a regional flavor because um, syrup is affected, the flavor of syrup is affected by the water and the minerals and the soil surrounding the tree. So maple syrup actually has a unique flavor to different regions. So if you were to buy just a pure maple syrup in the grocery store, a lot of those syrups are purchased from all over and then blended together to make one uh, maple syrup. But if you get syrup from a local producer, that syrup actually has all of the local minerals and soil, all of that good stuff. That flavor is actually in that local maple syrup. So our maple syrup wins awards. So I would recommend finding a local producer getting some pure Northeast Ohio maple syrup. So we're going to go a little bit more. I just can't figure out how to say that closer to our time in history, more modern sugar making techniques. So um, here are some tapping tools that have been used um, in the mid 20th century to today. My favorite is the backpack tapper. It was a motorized tapper that someone would wear on their backs and drill the holes in the tree. And then a motorized tapper. And today sugar make makers tap their tree with a uh, battery powered drill out in the sugar bush. So it's definitely advanced and gotten a little bit easier and lighter throughout history. So today, a lot of plastic is used for collecting, plastic spiles, plastic buckets hanging from trees, uh, plastic bags, plastic storage jugs, and then the gathering buckets are poured into pails that are made of plastic as well. And then a lot of times today, if you drive through the sugar bush, um, if you drive through, not the sugar bush, if you drive through Geauga County along our rural roads, you'll see these plastic tubes from the trees. And when I first moved to Geauga County, I didn't actually realize what this was. And I thought it was weird that people had their trees tied together. But now I realize that this is a network of tubes that collect sap from the maple trees and all direct it to one location where gathering can be done. So if we have 800 trees at Geauga Park District that normally are collected from buckets, but these plastic tubes are all connected, there's a line that drops from a, a tap down into a lateral line that all connects into a main line that's collected in one location. So a lot of folks that have a normal uh, nine to five job can still do maple sugaring because it's a lot less collecting time out in the sugar bush. It's still a lot of time to set up these plastic tubing systems, but um, the collection, when it actually comes down to that, there's less time because all the sap's directed to one location. So there's a lot of other technology that's used today. A reverse osmosis systems. A lot of folks have these in their house to clean their water. So normally you're remo removing the impurities from water and drinking the fresh water that has the impurities removed. And so maple sugar makers have actually kind of reversed this system and they break the maple sap down into pure water and then uh, water with 
the sugar inside. So normally the sugar would be considered an impurity and tossed aside, but that's actually what the maple sugar makers are after. So here at Geauga Park District, we have a reverse osmosis system and it takes the maple sap from about 2% sugar to 4% sugar. And it actually reduces the boiling time in the evaporator by about an hour. So these systems have become really popular from hobby producers all the way to our more um, commercial producers. There's steam hoods that kind of, uh, there's a sap preheater there. You can see that picture as well. This preheats the sap and it, the sap enters the evaporator already warm, which reduces the amounting, amount of time boiling. Heated canners are really important because they bring the syrup up to a specific temperature that helps to uh, make sure that the sap is preserved in the bottle correctly. And then we also have filter presses where our syrup is actually forced through these different banks of filter papers and um, the impurities are removed from the sap. So before it's put through this filter press, the syrup is actually incorporated, um, I'm sorry, di diatomaceous earth, food grade diatomaceous earth is added to the syrup and then pushed through the filter press. That earth, diatomaceous earth kind of traps the impurities and then they're filtered back out through that filter press. All right, so refinements in the tubing system have happened as well. So this clear spile has a little ball inside and that's that allows the sap to not be pulled back into the tree. So during certain freeze and thaw cycles, if there's sap in the tubing lines, the tree can actually pull the sap back into it, which is not good because it can introduce bacteria into that tap hole and the tap hole will close sooner in the season. So that check valve means when saps, or the tree tries to suck the sap back into it, it closes and doesn't allow that to happen. And then we also have vacuum pumps that are used in sugar bushes today. These tubing systems have vacuum attached to the end of them. And so the sap is actually sucked through the lines and out of the tree a little bit, which increases the sap yield from our trees. And it doesn't hurt them. There's been a lot of research that shows it's not taking too much sap from the tree. So it's always been labor intensive and weather dependent. Um, we normally tap around President's Day. This year at our sugar bush, we tapped about a week later just because we had such a hard freeze. In previous years, folks have tapped as early as January. So it's all very weather dependent um, for the sap to flow. But the parade of new technologies has made the whole process a little bit easier and helped with sugar ma maple yields for our producers. So, there are still a lot of challenges, even though we have a lot of technological advancements. There's a lot of um, diseases and insects that can damage our maple trees. So pear thrips, Asian longhorn beetle, uh, maple sap disease, maple decline, and even our changing climate can have an effect on maple production and our maple trees. Our sugar maples aren't as good at kind of adapting to the changing environment, but our red maples seem to be doing a little bit, having a little bit of an easier time adjusting to our, our changing climate. So there are a lot of organizations. So there's two, two main organizations in Northeast Ohio and in Ohio in general. The Ohio Maple Producers Association represents maple sugar makers across the state. And then we also have a Northeast Ohio Maple Producers Association. So these organizations, especially MPA, Ohio Maple Producers Association, um, advocates at the state level for sugar make makers and um, maple a preservation of maple trees and different uh, laws that can help protect maple syrup production and sugar makers. And they also both do a lot of education. So the next two weekends in Northeast Ohio and across the state are actually maple tours. So the Maple Madness Tour is going on across the state of Ohio and the Northeast Ohio Maple Producers Association is also doing a drive it yourself tour. So you can visit there um, websites or Facebook pages for more information. There'll be sugar houses open across the counties 
in Northeast Ohio and the state where you can actually visit and see maple syrup production in action. Um, so the maple syrup industry today persists with a lot of maple syrup, sugar, sauces, and beverages. I've even seen maple water for sale at the store, which is just bottled maple sap. So this is a popular product and it's delicious. And it's sold today as not just um, maple syrup, but more of Americana. It kind of represents the history and heritage of um, America. So another big uh, maple related festival, I'm sure you've heard of the Geauga County Maple Festival. It's been going on since 1926 and it helps to, pr to promote maple syrup sales. So in the past, it's uh, featured a maple sugaring reenactment and still they're doing it today. This is one of our park district employees showing how the Native Americans use rocks to boil their sap. Um, it also features maple syrup and candy competitions and auctions and maple product sales. Uh, we have a maple festival king and queen. There's a draft for Jack demonstration. We have parades. Um, celebrities have even made the scene and amusement parks and rides and games. So maple syrup is really celebrated during the maple festival. And we even have a new sugar house in the Chardon Square. It's called the Heritage House. And there is a tap and Sunday event where it kind of kicks off the maple season. And then today's local maple attractions, I'm sure you've heard of the Burton Log Cabin. It's a old kind of historic log cabin in the Burton Square. And they still produce and do demonstrations at the log cabin in Burton. And like I said, there's tours going on, the Ohio Maple Madness Tour, and then a lot of local sugar maple, maple, makers around. We have Richard's Maple and Chardon, um, Sugarbush Creek Farm, Maple Valley Sugarbush. The list can really go on. Patterson's Farm, Geauga Park District. We have so many maple producers in Northeast Ohio. And in a pandemic-free year, there are maple uh, breakfast all over Northeast Ohio and especially in Geauga County. I saw that Century Village is doing a drive through pancake breakfast and I'm sure there's a lot of other organizations doing pickup breakfast this spring as well to celebrate our maple sugaring heritage. And of course Geauga Park District yearly we do a maple sugaring event called Saps Horizon. Unfortunately, it was canceled this year because of our social gathering limits, but we still have some other programs going on. And Amber and I were talking, they're actually all filled at this point. But I did see that Lake Metro Parks has some maple sugaring programs going on. And I'll share that screen with you so you can check that out. And then um, the other place where we can kind of celebrate maple syrup is the Geography Fair. So the Ohio Maple Producers Association and Northeast Ohio Maple Producers have a sugar house there in the natural resources area that you can come and visit and learn a little more about maple syrup. And there's also a syrup and candy competition at the fair as well. So those are all of my slides, but I want to go ahead and pull up, let's see here. I will pull up that screen for Lake Metro Parks. Oh no, did I lose it? It's Maple Sugaring Weekends. It's at the farm parks. So I would visit their website for more information. It looks like, um, I think I just Googled Lake Metro Parks Maple Sugaring Weekends. So you can find some um, local uh, maple events there in Lake County, or if you're in anywhere in Northeast Ohio, I'm sure you can still visit. And then also, just so everyone knows, if you're more interested in the science behind how maple syrup is made, or a little bit more about the details of actually producing maple syrup, I have a maple sugaring another maple sugaring program. It's called All About Maple Syrup. It's a virtual presentation on March 10th, and you can register for that through the Geauga Park District website. And it'll be more about uh, maple syrup production, more specific to the science and actually production of maple syrup. 
So I think that is all that I have to share with you all today. So let me stop sharing my screen here. And again, I apologize for any connection issues that we had. Hopefully, Amber, you can post the, the video and maybe folks can watch it again and kind of catch those things that they saw. Yeah. Thank you.